science in pajamas. All right, so as you can tell, I've kind of been shifting over as the light is coming straight down here because it messes with the um, light focus on the screen. So bear with me. Today we are gonna talk about experimental design process. Um, we're just gonna quickly, briefly talk about the steps. We're not gonna get into super detail. I just wanted to discuss the steps with you guys and kind of show you how we come up with it. Now, first off, a little hit information about it. The reason why we talk about the experimental design process when we also cover homeostasis is because of this idea of biotechnology or bioengineering. Now, this is where we can use technology to help us live better, healthier lives. And they can even help us with maintaining homeostasis if for whatever reason, whether through injury, illness, or genetics, something in our one of our systems doesn't work or function properly and we can't maintain homeostasis on our own, biotech can help us to achieve that. <clears throat> for instance, insulin. It is a medical or you can actually make medicine now, you can engineer it using bacteria, have them secrete a whole bunch of human insulin, and then you can sell it to help people with diabetes regulate their glucose levels so that they can stay healthy and, you know, alive. They shouldn't be selling it for like a super product or super, not product. Uh, profit, in my opinion, but you know, I'm just a lowly science teacher. So we are just going to talk a little bit about the steps that go into any kind of engineering design process, whether it is for a water filtration system or for creating a new medicine. They pretty much all go through these same processes. <clears throat> so the first step is to define your problem. So you might want to ask questions about the problem. For instance, let's use the idea of diabetes. The problem, what it causes diabetes? <clears throat> what is it that is preventing the insulin from being used or made in the cells? You might have to do some research about what glucose is, what insulin is, how that all works together. And then we're gonna delimit the problem. That's our next step. Now, when we delimit a problem, that means that we're gonna kind of define everything and figure out what are the exact limitations. Um, is it that we need more information? What kind of materials would we need to get? Will it be an expensive process? So we're gonna kind of go through and try and define the problem as much as we can. Now we're also going to do periodic checkpoints. So is the problem well defined? If it seems like it's well defined, or sorry, if it's not well defined, we'll go back, we'll continue to delimit the problem. If it does seem like it's well defined, we're going to move on to the next step, which is to brainstorm different solutions. So for diabetes, glucose level in the blood gets too high. So ideas could be to artificially create insulin that they can use to um, stimulate the liver cells in order to uptake the glucose. Maybe they'll they create something that would prevent the glucose from building up in the first place. So we're going to come up with all these different ideas. What could be possible solutions to this problem. After that, we are going to create a decision matrix, also known as a pug chart. Now, in the video that I'm going to do after this one, we're actually going to talk about how to fill one of those in. Um, but kind of, it helps us to look at the criteria that we feel is important for our solutions and compare it to each of our brainstormed ideas. Once we have completed the pug chart and we found maybe like one or two that seem to be the best possible ideas, 
we will build and test a model of our possible solutions. If the model, you know, if it meets the criteria and it seems to work, then we'll move on. If it doesn't, we'll go back, brainstorm new ideas. But if it does seem to work, then we'll do an analysis on the cost, benefit, and risk. So a cost is anything, any kind of resource that would be needed to make our solution, whether it is a financial cost or an environmental cost, any kind of resource that is needed. And the reason why we can also take an environmental cost is because what if we need a rare mineral and it's only found, you know, in rainforest? Well, then we're going to have to um, go through the rainforest, dig them up, mine them, and that can have an overarching effect, a negative effect on the possible possible you know climate situation and climate change also all the species there would become endangered and or extinct uh, benefit are the good things so what are the good things we can get out of this solution well we can maintain um, the glucose levels better in blood what are the risks so what kind of health risks so there can be a chance that it doesn't work Maybe it backfires and it creates or it allows the glucose to build up faster. Maybe it causes an infection. Maybe there is some kind of negative interaction with um, serotonin. So we're going to kind of have to look at those. And when you do this kind of analysis, you want to check to see does, do the benefits outweigh the cost and risk? If they do, you can build a prototype and test it. And if you test it and it seems like it's the best option, you can implement it. So you can start to use it, bring it to market. If not, you go back, you brainstorm some more solutions. Um, and like I said, there, you can keep checking back keep going until you pretty much feel like you finally get to the best idea and then you implement it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's experimental design process in a nutshell. Our next video is going to be on how to do a pug chart. All right, you guys take care. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.